have never in my entire life seen a, 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 a country developing a law meant for one person in the name of Sobuka Claus. A law meant for one person in the entire country. A law for that particular gentleman. And then it was never used on any other person except for Sobuka. That law was renewed every year to just make sure that they make his life, you know, hell. So again, uh, colleagues, uh, I welcome you to this uh, titan, to this uh, I won't have words to describe uh, Sobuku, but I welcome you to this start, to this thinker, not only in the here, but a thinker for South Africa and a thinker for the African continent, whereas excluded from the rest of the world. Somebody who could think for everyone. Somebody who even went ahead to inspire uh, Judge Mohor, Judge Yvonne Mohor. After she stood up for uh, a, a young man who was littering in, uh, in the Northern Cape, it was Sobukwe who actually inspired Jack Mohor to go and stand law so that she could uh, stand up more for, for justice. So, colleagues, uh, I welcome you to this uh, exchange, I welcome you to this Lohota uh, Inkun, uh, a meeting of ideas, and then with the theme of uh, uh, challenging the racist legal philosophy interrogating African uh, jurisprudence. In cases uh, where there's uh, an emergency, uh, there will be, you will hear beeps, and then over there, it's your emergency exit. And then, in, in cases of uh, biological calls, uh, I heard that uh, the gents are that side. I've never been to the ladies, but there's an allegation that there's also the ladies there. So please, help yourself. To that side and then in cases where somebody needs uh, assistance with anything we have uh, our colleagues on the table over there they'll be able uh, to assist you uh, without wasting any time uh, colleagues Dr. Uh, the podium is yours thank you so much colleagues thank you
different presentations that you will be hearing. We are looking forward to uh, knowledge sharing um, from the presenters, from yourselves. I know there will be some sessions where there will be some engagements and all that. I really cannot wait for that moment to come. Um, enjoy and thank you so much. For now, we will have a, a Sobukwe uh, tribute uh, poem. And then from there, we will go to the head of uh, the Institute for Dispute Resolution in Africa, College of Law, uh, David uh, Letoire. It was our suffering and our tears that nourished and kept him alive. Their law that killed him. Let no digits be sung, no shrine be raised to burden his memory. Such as he need no tombstone to speak their faith. Lay him down on high mountain, that he may look on the land he loved. The nation for which he died, men feared the fire of his soul. So good. You know, something that, that you have to appreciate about the art is that it adds flavor to, to, to life. So poets and, and, and writers, scholars, academics, and authors, they are a flavor to our life. Even some of the ideas that Sobuku had, they still nourish and serve as a flavor of the life that we live in this current era. Without uh, wasting any time, uh, colleagues, uh, I will go over to uh, the head of uh, the Institute for Dispute Resolution in Africa, uh, David Letoire. Please. One of the things that we do at IDRA is to advance the issue of cultural diplomacy. And in fact, we mentioned that when we in IDRA safety, we advance this thing of uh, cultural diplomacy as a tool for this peer resolution. Uh, because we also work with the, the whole issue of Miramaka's legacy and Miramaka Foundation. So, what we did there, because uh, Mira Makeba is no more, although the music is with us, we advanced the relationship that we had with the uh, Africanist and Black Consciousness Inspired Music Group, which has, worked, uh, which has agreed to partner with us in the whole area of cultural diplomacy. And that group is the uh, Rhythmic Elements. And they are here with us. Can, can you please? Uh, <laughs> we feel very proud to have them here because we need artists that are not captured. We need artists that are Afrocentric and Pan African without any apology. The Institute of Dispute Resolution in Africa and the Robert Mangalu Sudubu Trust are hosting this symposium especially to celebrate the Africa Month as proclaimed in the formation of the that book of this organization called the Organization of African Unity, OAU. Not AU, but the OAU. Somehow I tend to identify more with the Organization of African Unity and the African Union. I don't know why, but my blood just says I am. There must be something fun with African Union. But it's okay. So, my friend, that is why the May month is referred to as the Africa month. Importantly, this symposium seeks to celebrate a consummate struggling hero and indeed someone was celebrated by all Africans in addition to the academic and or intellectual engagement on how he confronted the racist laws of the occupied Azania. Or rather, how the settler colonialist laws in the occupied Azania mercilessly confronted and sadistically dealt with him. So he confronted the racist laws, but at the same time, the laws sadistically dealt with him. It is hoped that this engagement will help to build our anger as we continue the, the ever celebrated and indeed the over celebrated.
celebrated racist legal philosophy dominant in our country, in our institutions and local countries. With this anger, we should be able to deeply reflect on ourselves as Africans in these Eurocentric spaces and therefore begin to imagine, reconfigure and craft our African jurisprudence. In other ways and in simple terms, this symposium should assist us to challenge the laws that were imported from Europe and imposed on Africa. And thus, we should start raising critical questions about Africanizing the law in Azami and the study thereof. We need to decolonize the law, the law curriculum, and the mental state of those who teach the law. In other ways, Africa, let's not be lazy to travel back to uncontaminated African spaces. The least distance we can travel back to at least is 1651. So let us not be lazy to travel back, back to those uncontaminated spaces. And I challenge you to say the least distance we should travel to is 1651. I know that it is unavoidable to engage in a discourse on the Google and the law and really not go down or go to town about the General Law Amendment Act of that day in, in May 1963. That clause which became known as the Sobuku Clause. As the program director said earlier on, this clause empowered the apartheid authorities to detain Robert Sobuku indefinitely. However, it is not my role to deal with this loss. Our panelists are here. But just to emphasize the point I made earlier on that it is not fashionable to talk about the people to celebrate. I was thinking all this time that could we imagine if this loss was actually crafted, let's say for, you know, because I don't know of any other person that I can relate to, let's say this force was formulated and crafted to deal with the Mandela. The Mandela clause. Can you imagine how the whole world would have gone to turn up with this? How many books would have been written about movies and everything else. Because this clause has never been applied to anybody else but to this specific man, Robert Sobo. But it's been downplayed. In fact, I don't know of any other country in the world where there was a clause specifically meant for a particular person. I only know of this one in the Paris of Africa where it was dedicated only to Sobo. But I can tell you that even many university students, even those who are doing law, don't really know about this particular case. Because it was a supported loss and not a Mandela clause. Mafri, allow me to say how truly excited I am to see you all gathered here. I'm not surprised because we have been called here by the spirit of the book to inspire us was the dream of realizing a free Azami. So we have been convened here by Professor Book. Because this is a spirit that has been obstinate and refused to die. You know there are many spirits that die, but this particular one refused to die. It is the spirit that survived multinational companies, imperialism, colonialism, capitalism, apartheid, and indeed rainbowism. In spite of this heavy, heavy thing called rainbowism, the spirit of Mangosu survived. That is why the land question, when it, it was found to be suppressed by rainbowism, still 
refused to be buried because the spirit of Robert Mangles of Robert refused to die. This is the spirit that says resisted the onslaughts of the late peace. In Africa, the dream of Azania is not just about changing the name Azania or the greeting is the name. We must go beyond this thing of trying to identify ourselves is the name Azania. Let's go beyond this. Let's go deep. Because I believe that there's a deep and underlying subject to all these things, all these ways. It's about dealing with white supremacy and white settler colonialism. It is about a truly liberated African society. It's about repossession of land from those who conquered Africa. It is about creating a society in Africa which truly identifies with and carries the values of Africans. In short, it is the realization of a country where Africans stride confidently like lions in the jungle. This is how we were before the white men came. We strove confidently and triumphantly in our African jungles, just like lions. It is the creation of the home of justice, where just laws are applied justly. And that is what we mean by the Asanian dream. Because, look, because they don't have in Azalia unjust laws applied. Africa, I want to emphasize that correct things need to be done correctly. Because no matter how elegantly or how stylishly you drink poison, the result is always death. By the way, this point was emphatically made by Sir Book as well. Where he said, I just lost, cannot be applied justly. What was the first saying is that no matter how stylishly and elegantly you drink poison, the result will always be death. So the law is at the center of it all. It can be used for oppression and it can also be used for justice. That is why it's to book each other the unjust laws of the time. So what about us? What about us? Especially those in academic spaces. We cannot continue to perpetuate the unjust white settler colonial laws because these have to be challenged. However, this process needs consciousness. It needs Afrocentric intellectuals and law academics. So Booker brought his consciousness and pan Africanism and its and this whole life view to the law. So he didn't just take law as, as it was presented to him. He brought in his consciousness, his pan Africanist life view to the law. Finally, and I'm happy that uh, Dr. Gole uh, stole my script last night. When he talked about if so, who were to be a pain. And I was quite happy when he made this point to say, let us be practical right now, seriously so, and say, if so, who were to reappear on the face of this earth today, how would he react to the currents of African law and its jurisprudence? Remember that all law in this country must conform to the letter and spirit of the Constitution. That is the Constitution that was negotiated with the settlers. So then the Freedom Charter, and I want us to be attentive to this one. Like the Freedom Charter, the Constitution of South Africa, in its preamble, says the following, and I want to quote that. We, the people of South Africa, not the people of Azan, we, the people of South Africa, recognize the injustice of the past, 
not of the present. People like the just saw the past, and now he is the dream. And we believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. I close the quote. That is the, the constitution of South Africa. Now, remember the question is, if Robert Sobukoi would appear on the face of this earth, what would his relation be to the current laws? So the constitution, amongst others, says in its framework, South Africa belongs to all who live in it. So, so we will tribute a point, please. Grace us uh, with your with your presence, and I hope I'm I'm mentioning it right. So who we should you Paul? Can you please give him a round of applause, please? Thank you, Yes, uh, thank you very much. Is the way to? In Africa, Shangalashu, Africa, my name is Shonani Warabada. I've been requested to render this uh, poem uh, written by the great one, Papa Donald Matera. It goes this way. So, it was our suffering and our tears that nourished and kept him alive. Their love that killed him. Let no digits be sung, nor shrine be raised to burden his memory. Such as, such as he need no tombstone to speak their fame. Lay him down on high mountain, that he may look on the land he loved. The nation for which he died, men feared the fire of his soul. So, thank you so much uh, for such a moving uh, piece of poetry. You know, something that, that you have to appreciate about the art is that it adds flavor to, to, to life. So poets and, and, and writers, scholars, academics, and authors they are a flavor to our life. Even some of the ideas that Sobuku had, they still nourish and serve as a flavor of the life that we live in this current era. Without uh, wasting any time, uh, colleagues, uh, I will go over to uh, the head of uh, the Institute for Dispute Resolution in Africa, uh, David Letoir. Please. Thank you, Prime Director. Uh, May uh, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to say a few words in order to set the scene for this important engagement this morning to acknowledge African Federation Man. Before I proceed, I just wanted to say that um, we are holding this symposium against a heavy doubt on the institute. The president of the was organizing this uh, symposium, that is Advocate Sipoma Dunya, uh, had to disengage from it from yesterday because he had just lost with his uh, brother. So I speak here from that context. So I would like to also thank the leadership of the College of Law here at Ubisa, as represented by our esteemed deputy, ex-deputy, Dr. Papakoko Kole, for allowing us also to do some unfortunate events function. They allowed us to sound unfashionable in this country. 
that is this course on our spiritual father, the demon of Jesus Professor's book. That this course on him is something unfashionable in this country. Yes, it's true, Matthew. It is not fashionable to acknowledge the book and the Africanism. I also wish to salute our panelists here, colleagues at IGRA, in this attack, and indeed all of you, Matthew. There's something that I want to say that, uh, you know, we are so complete in this house. We are complete because we are here with us. Thank you. You can't be more complete than this. But then it's also with another African member of the next to him. I also want to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Tsetsi Mulibaz, another standout. And I also noticed uh, that Noah Sito. I've seen Ikuma Kare. So it's not my, my space to introduce people here, but I just felt I had to do that. So one of the things that we do at IDRA is to advance the issue of cultural diplomacy. And Dr. Uh, Kore mentioned that when we in IDRA recently, we advance this thing of uh, cultural diplomacy as a tool for the spiritual solution. Uh, because we also work with uh, the whole issue of Miramakaya's legacy and Miramakaya Foundation. So, what we did there, uh, because uh, Mira Makeba is no more, although he visited this with us, we advanced the relationship that we had with the uh, Africanist and Black Consciousness Inspired Music Group, which has, worked, uh, which has agreed to partner with us in the whole area of cultural diplomacy. And that group is the uh, Republic Elements, and they are here with us. Can, can you please uh, We feel very proud to have them here because we need artists that are not captured. We need artists that are Afrocentric and Pan African without any apology. The Institute of Distribution in Africa and the Robert are hosting this symposium especially to celebrate the African month as proclaimed in the formation of the that part of this organization called the Organization of African Unity, OAU. Not AU, but the OAU. Somehow I tend to identify more with the Organization of African Unity than the African Union. I don't know why, but my blood just says I am. There must be something fun with African Union. But it's okay. So, my friend, that is why the main man is referred to as the African man. Importantly, this symposium seeks to celebrate a constantly striving hero and indeed someone was celebrated by all Africans in addition to the academic and or intellectual engagement on how he confronted the racist laws of the occupied Tanzania, Or rather, how the settler colonialist laws in the occupied Tanzania mercilessly confronted and sadistically dealt with him. So he confronted the racist laws, but at the same time, the laws sadistically dealt with him. It is hoped that this engagement 
will help to invade our area as we critique the, the ever celebrated and indeed the overly celebrated racist legal philosophy dominant in our country, in our institutions and lawful countries. With this anger, we should be able to deeply reflect on ourselves as Africans in these Eurocentric spaces and therefore begin to imagine, reconfigure and craft our African jurisprudence. In other ways and in simple terms, this symposium should assist us to challenge the laws that were imported from Europe and imposed on Africa. And thus, we should start raising critical questions about Africanizing the law in Azami and the study thereof. We need to decolonize the law, the law curriculum, and the mental state of those who teach the law. In other ways, Africa, let's not be lazy to travel back to uncontaminated African spaces. The least distance we can travel back to at least is 1651. So let us not be lazy to travel back, back to those uncontaminated spaces. And I challenge you to say the least distance we should travel to is 1651. I know that it is unavoidable to engage in a discourse on Sobobe and the law and really not go down or go to town about the General Law Amendment Act of that day in, in May 1963. That clause which became known as the Sobobe Clause. As the program director said earlier on, this clause empowered the apartheid authorities to detain Robert Sobobe indefinitely. However, it is not my role to deal with this trust. Our panelists are here. But just to emphasize the point I made earlier on that it is not fashionable to talk about the book or to celebrate. I was thinking all this time that could we imagine if this clause was actually crafted, let's say for, you know, because I don't know of any other person that I can relate to, let's say this clause was formulated and crafted to deal with the Mandela. The Mandela clause. Can you imagine how the whole world would have gone to turn up with this? How many books would have been written about movies and everything else. Because this clause has never been applied to anybody else but to this specific man, Robert Obama. But it's been downplayed. In fact, I don't know of any other country in the world where there was a clause specifically made for a particular person. I only know of this one in the Paris where it was dedicated only to the book. But I can tell you that even many university students, even those who are doing law, don't really know about this particular case. Because it was a supported clause and not a Mandela clause. Mafri, allow me to say how truly excited I am to see you all gathered here. I'm not surprised because we have been called here by the spirit of the book to inspire us was the dream of realizing a free asylum. So we have been convened here by Professor Book. Because this is the spirit that has been obstinate and refused to die. You know there are many spirits that die, but this particular one refused to die. It is the spirit that survived multinational companies, imperialism, colonialism, capitalism, apartheid, and indeed rainbowism. In spite of this heavy, heavy thing called rainbowism, the spirit of Mangosuru survived. 
That is why the land was when it, it was not used to press the rainbow is still refused to be buried because the spirit of Robert Bangles of the Buddha refused to die. This is the spirit that says resisted the onslaught on the land base. In Africa, the dream of Azania is not just about shaking the name Azania or the greeting is the name. We must go beyond this thing of trying to identify ourselves easily to Azania. Let's go beyond this. Let's go deep. Because I believe that there's a deep and underlying substance to all these things, all these ways. It's about dealing with what's within us and why self colonialism. It is about a truly liberated African society. It's about repossession of land from those who conquer Africa. It is about creating a society in Africa which truly identifies with and carries the values of Africans. In short, it is the realization of a country where Africans stride confidently like lions in the jungle. This is how we were before the white men came. We strove confidently and triumphantly in our African jungles, just like lions. It is the creation of the home of justice, where just laws are applied justly. That is what we mean by the Azanian dream. Because not because they don't have in Azania and just laws applied. I want to emphasize that correct things need to be done correctly. Because no matter how elegantly or how stylishly you drink poison, the result is always death. By the way, this point was emphatically made by the book as well, where he said, I just laws cannot be applied justly. What was actually saying is that no matter how stylishly and elegantly you drink poison, the result will always be death. So the law is at the center of it all. It can be used for oppression and it can also be used for justice. That is why it's to put each other the unjust laws of the time. So what about us? What about us? Especially those in academic spaces. We cannot continue to perpetuate the unjust white central colonial laws because this have to be challenged. However, this process needs consciousness. It needs Afrocentric intellectuals and law academics. So, Booker brought his consciousness and Pan Africanism and his and this whole life view to the law. So, he didn't just take law as, as it was presented to him, he brought in his consciousness, his Pan Africanist life view to the law. Finally, and I'm happy that uh, Dr. Bolle uh, stole my script last night. When he talked about if the book were to be a pain, and I was quite happy when he made this point to say, let us be proud right now, seriously so, and say, if the book were to reappear on the face of this earth today, how would he react to the current South African law and its prosperities? Remember that all law in this country must conform to the letter and spirit of the Constitution. That is the Constitution that was negotiated with the settlers. So then the Freedom Charter, and I want us to be attentive to this one. Like the Freedom Charter, the Constitution of South Africa in this preamble says the following, and I want to quote that. We, the people of South Africa, 
not the people of Tanzania. We, the people of South Africa, recognizing the injustice of the past, not of the present. Recognize the injustice of the past, and now here's the thing. And we believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. And close the court. That is the, the constitution of South Africa. Now, remember the question is, if Robert Sobukoy were to appear on the face of this earth, what would his relation be to the current laws? So the constitution, amongst others, says in its framework, South Africa belongs to all who live in it. So, uh, the head of the Institute for Dispute Resolution in Africa. Uh, the, the African culture uh, does not teach uh, disrespect. So, when the elders talk, uh, anybody below the elders mustn't add, subtract, or try to analyze what the elders are saying. And that's what I will follow uh, with the panelists. Uh, I won't uh, subtract, analyze, minimize, or zoom into what uh, the elders are saying. Uh, each of the panelists uh, seated here will have uh, about 15 minutes. And my two colleagues, uh, Ms. Tamisile Libito and Mrs. Wikuto Fusi, will help me uh, when it comes to uh, moderating the, the time, while I focus on other things. The head of the institute, he spoke about the African laws. And then now we have this thing in the country called the Zondo Commission. But as you know that uh, in the African jurisprudence, if you catch McDonald with stolen property, I stole this pen. In the African jurisprudence, I'm not a suspect. You, you saw me. I took the pen. We saw McDonald, he took the pen. But in these Western laws, and then you become a suspect. Now we also learn that uh, the more power you have, you, you neither a suspect, nor the Western laws do not even apply to you. In comes, uh, we have to have an inquiry as to how McDonald took the pen, with whom, what did he use it for, for what purpose, when, and all the likes. And so Booker would have actually challenged uh, such discrepancies and loopholes in our laws. Uh, the first uh, uh, panelist uh, to grace your presence will be uh, Professor Simpiwe Sesanti. Remember I told you that uh, this elders here, they told me when I said I needed a biography, they said, no, say it how you know it. <coughs> so what I'm going to say here, Prof, uh, it's how I know it. Uh, Prof Simpiwe Sesanti, sometimes uh, I see in, in, in the medical fraternity, they say that uh, instead of saying that uh, this person is, is, is brain dead or they say this person has lost consciousness. And so Booker's conscious was, consciousness was intact. <coughs> Prof Sesanti is a conscious academic, a scholar of note, somebody who has been through, uh, you know, the academic cycles, but never lost consciousness, never lost character. I do not know what made Professor Santi's character to be as it is, because he's a force to be reckoned with. And I've had many engagements. Uh, the latest engagement that I've had with you, Prof, was when we were in Blackfontein, opening uh, uh, the Guinness Fontaine in, in, in the Northern Cape, and the engagements that we shared. Prof. Santi is is more than a teacher, is more than somebody who will deliver. And without wasting any time, Prof. Santi is the right person to talk on this tower, to talk on this uh, giant called Robert Mangani Sobuko. So without wasting any time, colleague, uh, Prof. Santi, the podium is yours. Round of applause, please. Come 
It is our tears and our suffering that nourished and kept him alive. They are no that king. Let no dedges be sung, no shrines be raised to bed in his memory. Men such as he need no tombstones to tell their fame. Lay him on a high mountain so that he may look on the land he loved, the nation he died for. Men feared the fire of his soul. And so Matera tells us two things of what Mangali Sosobu, or at least three, that it was our tears and our suffering that kept him alive. Our tears and our suffering kept Mangali Sosobukwe alive. And he tells us that it is their law that killed him. It was not an accident of history. It was their law that killed him. It was central in seeking to destroy Mangaliso Sobu. But then Mangaliso Matera tells us the third thing in this poem. He says, men feared the fire of his soul. <coughs> and this is why it was important that there had to be a law that would be special to isolate and keep Mangaliso Sobukwe from everything and everyone because they feared the fire of his soul. They could not handle the fire of Mangaliso Sobukwe. Hence, the Sobukwe laws. It was not an accident of history. And so Mugiwa Fiongo tells us that uh, when a child or children are sent into the bush to call dough and collect firewood, they must not fall to the temptation of taking this firewood, making fire out of it, and warming themselves alone in the bush. That is not the mission. The mission is to bring firewood to the community so that the community can benefit. And so fire can serve two purposes. Fire can alienate, but fire can also endear. Fire would give us life because there would be food. And so Mangaliso Sobukwe had to be isolated because he was the fire that was going to enable us to eat. The fire that was going to enable us to have a life and hence the Sobukwe clause so that Mangali so Sobukwe would be the fire that would be alienated from his people. And Matera tells us that men feared the fire of his soul. And please forgive me, everyone, for not having uh, extended greetings. But when I was talking to the ancestors, 
I was asking them at the same time to enable me to connect you to me and me to them. As I'm sitting here, when I saw that the Mutoko people were coming in, I trembled with anxiety and fear. Because it cannot be that I would be in a position to speak what I need to speak about in the presence of Ndate Mutokope. Mm -hmm. But then something comforted me. The ancestors began to whisper into my ears and said that this is a living ancestor. Mm -hmm. What our ancestors did in their time, they would train their young men and their young women. <coughs> and they would sit back to, 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 to ensure and to determine whether or not the sons and daughters would be able to carry the legacy forward. And so I sit here today because I was able to read one of the best books that I've ever read. It's Apartheid, the story of a dispossessed people written by Ndatemu Tsogope. And so I hope that uh, in the few minutes that I stand here, it will not be as if I never read that book that is so much of wisdom. And so here we are. I began when the, the, the program director, I listened to him, he was saying that uh, uh, he has not been uh, to the ladies section. And I understood that he meant literally, he was referring to the, bar, to the bathroom. But I also knew that there was a danger that in his statement, he would literally be thinking that he has never been to the ladies. And there is a very important uh, uh, significance in that. <laughs> And you've got to understand this, that life begins with women. The first home of any human being is the woman. And so it cannot be that the program director has never been to the ladies. <laughs> so it's been there. The life began, it began with the ladies. The only physical connection that he can ever claim is that with the ladies and it is with the umbilical cord. Our ancestors told us that uh, you are your mama's baby, but you are your papa's maybe. It is not certain that you are your papa's baby, but certainly you are your mama's baby. And so this is very significant. It is for this reason that our ancestors did not refer to this part of the world. They did not refer to it as the fatherland. It was not an accident of history that our ancestors thought that Africa is the motherland. Because at all times, mothers, mothers are the beginning. Mothers, mothers are central. Mothers, mothers are everything. And so when we speak, then Africans and this young man, Ayikwe um, Ama says that we, that we the black people, are we, uh, that we the black people are one people we know. Travelers will travel long distances in their minds to deny you this truth. We do not argue with them, the fools, because we know who we are. That we, the black people, are one people we know. Travelers will travel long distance in their minds to destroy them. We, we do not argue with them, the fools. Let them presume to speak us about ourselves. That too is in their nature. And so when Mangaliso Sobukwe embraced Pan-Africanism, he had that understanding. He had an understanding from Chief Anta Dion that Pan-Africanist members of the Pan-Africanist Congress the reason that your organization is so weak, that it is so weakened, is that you never understood, we never understood the fifth aim of the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania. Mm. And the fifth aim of the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania is that we must promote and project the African image and personality to the whole world. We did not pay attention to that. The second thing that we're not paying attention to, because we've got to look at ourselves, why is it fashionable, Comrade Itzwalo, to speak about the Pan Africanist Congress of Mangaliso Sobukwe, the Mangaliso Sobukwe of Pan Africanist Congress? In the apart, the sort of apartheid, the sort of a dispossessed people, that Imutoko tells us that in 1960, everyone was speaking about the PAC boys. There was nothing else. 
to speak about but the PC boys. Franz Fanon in the Richard of the Earth writes about March 21, 1960. There was nothing else to speak about at that time. Kwame Nkrumah, when he was looking, he spoke about Sobukwe and said, he's an idol of the African youth. When Bantu people came in, in a crowd where people were speaking, and you saw Mama Liso Sobukwe, he said in his Kosa, Tiko Kandino Tiko Gokwake Ula. Watch Bantu. It is fashionable today, it is unfashionable today. And the problem has got nothing, it has got less to do with the enemy, with the power of the enemy. Everything has got to do with the weakness of those who call themselves Pan-Africanists. Yes. <laughs> because they never understood. They never understood that Mangali Sosobuku, after uniting the African people, said that, we will overthrow white domination in all its forms. White domination, in whatever form it manifests itself, must be completely overhauled. And so Mangali Sosobukwe was also referring to and especially to the laws. But we never understood this because it became fashionable for us first as members of the Pan-Africanist Congress to be proud when as a member of the PAC, you're the only member and you go boasting about this and say, hey, my Africa, do you dare to pour up with us strand? <laughs> because it feels special to be alone. You become individualistic, something that Mama Liso Sobukwe never taught you. And so hence, it becomes fashionable or unfashionable not to, to unfashionable to speak about Mangali Sosobukwe and fashionable not to speak about Mangali Sosobukwe because we, the pan Africanists, we missed an important point. We did not bother Mangali. The basic document of the pan Africanist Congress of Tanzania tells us that it is a responsibility of the pan Africanists not only to be presentable in terms of clothes, but to be made presentable in terms of ideas. And ideas do not flow from the sky. If you engage, it is not enough to call the Freedom Charter a sellout document. You've got to be able to make reference to a, a Mushwesh, who told the white people that never ever make a mistake. You may stay as long as you like, but you've got to understand that at all times, you will always be passerbys in our land. You do not own an inch. <laughs> so we've got to be able to contextualize this and refrain from what we do and continue to be doing to simply shout. Mangali Sosobukwe was not a man who shouted. He was a soft-spoken person. When he arrived in Gualang and saw this Amagotuk, he said to them, Ema Africa, Nigena Bonaba, Kabe Amba Bati Baya Amba, E Bayo Bayo Singelava Zingel. When they go to hunt, when they come back, what takes place there is that it was the dogs who were chasing the animals. And yet then what takes place is that when the, the food is being distributed, the dogs are only given dogs, I mean bones. And it is the hunters that eat the meat. Mm -hmm. And they set up these rural people and they understood what Mangali Sosoboko was saying. <coughs> he did not speak about scientific socialism and capitalism mm -hmm. because he knew that these people would not understand these isms and ologies. But because we are so captured in our minds, even as we claim decolonization, we are in contradiction because Franz Fanon tells us you can't find the most people who have got an inferiority complex than the educated people. Mm -hmm. Because the educated people want to sound and speak about epistemology and speak about the reason to try and speak about the words and the food and they're not understood by the ordinary people because they feel good about themselves and that was the purpose of Eurocentric education so that you may look at yourself as being better than everyone else and that's why we are where we are <laughs> the discipline challenge of the revolution as student of the demo I've got only one minute 
And I've not said anything that I wanted to say. I said everything that I didn't want to say. But that's not up to me. I blame that on the ancestors. Because before I spoke, I asked them to guide me. If they did not guide me, then it's not my problem. But I will not be so rude and say it is their problem. The ancestors can strike me down and I won't be able to stand up. So we leave it there. On this point there. On this note, the law of the African people was that the land can neither be sold nor be bought. It is the common property of the ancestors that will be cared for those who are yet to come. And so we have not understood this and that is why even as we speak about the land, the repossession of the land, we speak about plots, we speak about selling, we speak about buying, we are still moving on the lane yeah. that has been carved for us by our enemies because we did not study the law of our ancestors. In as much as I want to go on, but the time now is 11.25, and if I claim to be a Pan-Africanist and a child of Mangali Sosopopo, the student of the Demutopo people, I will stop right here. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, remember that law, colleagues? When the elders have spoken, don't add, don't subtract. <laughs> but there's, uh, let me just share with you one uh, incident that I remember with Prof. Sesanti. We were having a conversation, and then one of the, uh, must have been one of the community members, mentioned something about there seemed to be a white elephant. But then before uh, we could go into the conversation, that prof asked uh, that fellow student, you know, out of all the colors, I think we have chosen. You chose white elephant. <laughs> and I've never in my life <laughs> seen <laughs> a white elephant, a pink elephant, or a blue elephant, for that matter. So now he was... That uh, did, and all the other elders who we have not mentioned, I greet you all in Africa. This is it. Secondly, I would like to take this opportunity to also just give thanks to um, the Institute for Dispute Resolution in Africa for taking this initiative. I want to acknowledge and say that it is very important that this institution has made this decision because for a very long time, remains silence that erased from our national consciousness, from our public memory, as well as, you know, even within the academia, these institutions. And I think that today we have a very beautiful topic, Sobukwe and the law, challenging racist legal philosophy interrogating African jurisprudence. And for Africa, I think for me, what I want to do is that very often when we speak of Obama and the law, we confine the discussion only on him and the Sobukwe clause. And I think that there are many other issues. There are many other issues related to Obama and Sosobukwe that remain ignored, silenced, and erased. And I think that this is why um, these this are some of the issues that I want to look at today. From inception, from the inception of this political work, Sobukwe challenged the jurisdiction of the racist legal philosophy. He identified jurisprudence, legislation, and law enforcement as key institutions to be challenged. So Uwe understood that the settler colonialism and the subsequent dispossession and oppression of African people were not only instituted and legitimized through conquest, rape and murder, but they were also maintained through the prescriptions of the white man's law. With, a sus with succinct rigor and uh, vigor, Sobukwe challenged the racist philosophy inherent in the Roman Dutch law. He used African humanism and philosophy to expose the ruthlessness and the injustice of the settlers' so-called justice system. 
the ideology of the laws as currently constituted is informed by the racist philosophies of European philosophers like Immanuel Kant, Max Weber, Aristotle, Plato, and the rest of the gang. According to Sobukwe, the racist project of settler imperialism was maintained, sustained, and perpetuated through judicial, <coughs> legislative, and law enforcement institutions and agencies such as the police, the courts, and parliament. And there are, for me, seven significant areas or stages of Sobukwe's encounter with the law that are critical, and I want to deal with these seven stages just very briefly, my friend. The first encounter with the law was in 1950 when Sobukwe was appointed as a teacher at John Bell Secondary School in Stanerton. He taught there history, English, and geography. And in 1952, he lost his teaching post after speaking out in favor of the ANC's defiance campaign. This was perhaps one of the earliest recorded encounters of Sobukwe with the law. At that time, he was serving as the secretary of the ANC Stanerton branch. He challenged his dismissal, and owing to the prowess of his articulate arguments, he was reinstated as a teacher in Stanerton. The second encounter um, of Sobukwe followed the signing of the Freedom Charter in 1955. When the ANC leaders signed the Freedom Charter, which claimed that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. So Ukwe and his other colleagues in the PA and his other colleagues rejected it, stating that the land of the African people belonged to the indigenous people who were colonized and dispossessed by European settlers. Speaking about the Freedom Charter, So Ukwe said in 1955, the Cape Town Charter was adopted, which according to us is irreconcilable is irreconcilable conflict with the 1949 program, seeing that it claims land no longer African, but is auctioned for sale to all who live in this country. We have come to the parting of the ways, and we are here and now giving notice that we are disassociating ourselves from the ANC as it is constituted at present. So who were and the Africanists within the ANC called this document the Freedom Cheater. <laughs> As stated here earlier on uh, by O Brother David, certain elements of the Freedom Cheater were incorporated into the preamble of the new South African Constitution in 1996. The preamble reads, and I quote, we the people of South Africa believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity, close quote. It is important here that we note that the rule of law and the so-called supremacy of the Constitution are fundamental concepts in the hegemony of Western democracy. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And in fact, the very same Constitution reads, and I quote, we, the people of South Africa, adopt this constitution as the supreme law of the Republic. This means inevitably that today, colonial dispossession of African people's land and the perpetuation of gross violations of crimes against black humanity since the 6th of April 1652 continue to be ensured and protected by the prescripts of the South African law, officiated through the Constitution, legislated through Parliament, and enforced through the judicial court system and law enforcement agencies like the police. So when Sobukwe and his colleagues in the, in the ANC rejected the freedom cheetah, they were in fact rejecting the perpetual legitimization and legislation of the dispossession of African people. The third encounter 
of Sobukwe with the law relates to when he launched the positive action campaign against past laws on the 21st of March. And then the fourth encounter, I mean, we all know that from that day, the 21st of March, Ubawa Mamiso Sobuko was arrested and incarcerated. And he was not alone. You know, the young Philip Hosanna led the case march Kwalanga. Undate Zakias Gusho Omulete led the case march in Everton. George Joe led the case march in Alexander Township. So who led the march in Soweto? And Mao Yaga Nesoro led the case march in Shabdi. And the, the instruction that came from Sobukwe was that they go to jail under the slogan of no pay, no defense, and no fine. And all of these leaders were arrested on that day. Speaking in court and uh, during their trial after their arrest, Sobukwe said, we decided to bring about the immediate abortion of abolition of the past laws because that was the immediate need of the African people. We refuse to plead to the charges against us. We feel we have no moral obligation to obey laws made by a white minority. And without wishing to impugn the personal honor and integrity of the magistrate, an unjust law cannot be applied justly. The fourth encounter to Sobukwe related to Sobukwe and the law is when he was incarcerated at Pretoria Central Prison, the now Fort Mamboro. On the 22nd of November, 1962, while Sobukwe was on his second year serving prison sentence at Pretoria Central, about 250 Boko guerrillas carrying axes and tangas and other handmade weapons unleashed the Boko insurrection. The Snayman Commission that later followed the Boko insurrection in Pal concluded that Sobukwe was a co conspirator in that uprising. In line with this thinking, on the 4th of March 1963, the Cape Times in fact published an article which was titled Sobukwe was a Boko leader, in which Sobukwe was cast as the leader of bloodthirsty of a bloodthirsty movement of Africans who wanted to kill white people or drive them to the sea. The fifth encounter related to Bao Sobukwe and the law is the one that we all know and speak about very often, the Sobukwe Jaws. And I think I won't go through it. I mean, Unta De Munsuku Pepo has done a great job in recording some of the events that led, you know, a Sobukwe trial is recorded in here. Furthermore, Unta De Pepo gives us lots of evidence with regard to some of the discussions that were held, the debates, annual debates that were held in Parliament on Sobukwe, debating the so called Sobukwe clause. And uh, I think uh, if people want more information, you can just get this book from Ndaka Pepo or Mamu Au Pepo, The Land of Hours, the political legacy of Mangalisu Sobukwe. The sixth encounter of Pao Mangalisu Sobukwe relates to his banishment in Khadishiwe. There, Sobukwe was incarcerated under 12 hour uh, banishment, under consistent surveillance and his many orders prohibited him from participating in any political activity. You are not even permitted to teach in any school or even preach or pray in any church. And uh, I think I want to spend a little bit more time. I can see that I, uh, my time is a little bit spent, but what is important about Sobukwe's punishment in the issue is the fact that while he was banished there, he started studying law. And he was at this very same university at UNISA on the 12th of February 1970 that he registered with UNISA for the attorney's admission examination. 
and upon completion of his law degree, he entered articles of collection with Howard Zondwa Oma and Zimane attorneys practicing at number two, at number T12, Nyamani Street in Kalishiwe. After Sobukwe completed his articles and qualified as an attorney, he was barred from practicing law and he was denied permission to enter into any courts except as an accused or a witness. And on the 1st of March 1971, Justice Minister Jimmy Kruger issued a notice prohibiting Sobukwe from attending any court for the purpose of performing his duties at Zimani attorneys. Sobukwe to fight this racist banning orders and law to be accepted as a practicing attorney. And on the 30th of March 1974, his employment and services as a clerk at his money attorneys came to an end. On the 18th of May 1974, he was issued with his certificate recording that he had passed the attorney's admission here at Tunisia. So, my Africa, I can see that my time is up. But what is also very important, what was mentioned by the program director, is that Utakuso Ukwe, while he was in Kanishiwe, he practiced law. But because of the banning orders and the conditions imposed upon him, nothing, we have no evidence of any of the cases that he presided over. The only person that is public in law today is with Justice of Judge Yvonne Mohoro. Who so who were held when she was arrested for you know assisting a young man who were loitering according to the system there. And so who were argued in court and took her out. And so who were inspired her to study law. And she even says that so who were said that to her, there is no law that precludes women from studying law. So who were continued and practiced law and he helped the poor and the helpless Africans, largely pro bono in uh, in Ishiwe Township. And like I'm saying, no newspaper was even allowed to quote anything he said. None of the, the clients that he served could be interviewed in public. Nothing that, you know, a social was said in court could be uh, disclosed in public. You know, uh, and my Africa, the last one, with your permission program director. It relates to Sohuwe's uh, death. The last, the seventh encounter of Sohuwe in the law, it relates to his death. We all know that after he died, there were many restrictions imposed upon people from attending during his funeral. Sohuwe, uh, Oma Mo Sohuwe, were chased out of the property in Kibari. And Mao Sohuwe had to, you know, uh, go around the country looking for a place to stay and work there. To stay in Addis. But what is also important is that So Ukwe, in 1985, he was awarded degrees and doctors of laws by the University of Amadou Bello in Nigeria. And the second one, that was not the only posthumous honorary degree in law that So Ukwe was awarded. The second one, the doctor of laws, was awarded by the University of Forte in 1998. The third one, Doctor of Laws, was awarded by the Vets University in 2003. The fourth one, Doctor of Laws, was awarded by UNISA 20th October 2015. But the tragedy in all of this is that none of these institutions have even a course in their legal ed department of Sobukwe. There is nothing that is taught of Sobukwe anywhere in these institutions. Sobukwe remains silenced and erased even by the so-called academics. And uh, like I'm saying, this is a challenge, and that is why we are proud of ITRA for taking this initiative. And we hope that this will uh, build up and culminate in something that young people who are studying law today must learn about Sobukwe beyond the Sobukwe clause. We must learn more. We must go and investigate in the Department of Justice why they expunged so Sobukwe's testimony when he was speaking in the courts. And so, my Africa, I don't want to uh, waste any more time. Some of the other issues will be raised during the engagement. Give thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Russ.
Uh, the next speaker is Mo Africa Kodi Sanfokaba. Mo Africa Kodi Sanfokaba is a former past president, labor and trade union activist, an unapologetic Africanist, and academic in legal philosophy and jurisprudence at Jumisa. So please uh, help me in welcoming Mo Africa Kodi Sanfokaba. start by saying Songo was not just any other person. He was not everything to everybody. Songo had an organization. I've seen in the past couple of days uh, <coughs> people attempting to quote Songo in defense of regress. Songo's quotation are used by young people at UNISA to defend anti-transformation agenda anti-progress and in that space in the ANC Youth League and the ANC in the elections so it fit to use Sobuga's image in their t-shirts and coat him but they could not give him the honor and give him a voice in South African history Chair I want to start by Acknowledging the presence of the People's Dean of respect. The People's Dean, Dr. Kole, <coughs> members of the Mangalisa Robert Sobuga Trust, and the leadership of Sobuga's ship, the Pan Africanist Congress of Australia. <coughs> Members of staff of IDRA, and to you all, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I also want to acknowledge in our midst, in Isizu, in the Gurira, we say, Il Kiosil Pilai, Dr. Mutsukope. to judge, because the records of history will show that the pan african Student Organization in 1995 in its Congress in Tefio made a call before, before some of the political prisoners were even jailed by the ANC to say all those who were involved in the struggle against the party were engaged in a just cause. A democratic government cannot convict them for having fought the party. But we know what transpired. Some of them are still let me see. Let me move on. History will, will tell us. I'm requested to give this talk at a time where institutions of higher learning, but more importantly, the faculties of law, are in a crisis. This is a crisis which comes more than 25 years after the first democratic elections and the sixth parliament has been constituted. The, the faculty of law, the faculty of law has become a battlefield between forces of Helen Fortism and forces of Africanism in the knowledge production. The University of Cape Town Law Faculty has been called out recently for being an all-white professor's club and they are good black friends in the second position. Yes, as legal academics, we are in a crisis of existence because we continue to produce, we continue to be produced by the system and the curriculum that deny our existence as both human beings and producers of any form of knowledge in the legal field. The law and how it's produced 
is not a geologically neutral and innocent process. The law is made and determined by the most politically powerful in society to control and modify the conduct of the politically oppressed in that society. In the colonial and neocolonial society like South Africa, the African people are the only people who are culturally, economically and socially dominated but are free to legislate on behalf of their oppressor and for the benefit of their oppressors. What do we need? Is the second question now. Is the issue of trust. We need the right mindset, the right personnel, and to make the necessary sacrifices. We need to have undying love for Africa and its people. We need to be like Sobu and to understand Sobu, the man, and his ideological stand in his own ways. We need to understand the role, education, and underlying and its underlying ideology. Least we reproduce the very system that seeks to destroy us and keep us in perpetual subjugation. We must have a correct ideological posture because the law and jurisprudence as it stands, continue to produce a global racist jurisprudence and has normalized it. So we had this to say in 1949, his first encounter. In 1949, at the University of Hodeh graduation ceremony, I quote, the cowards are still standing aside and the brave had made a choice. We have made our choice and we have chosen African nationalism because of its deep human significance, <laughs> because of its inevitability and necessity to world progress. World civilization will not be complete until Africa has made its full contribution. We must fight for freedom to the right to call our soul our own, and we must pay the price. History has taught us that a group in power has never voluntarily relinquished its position. It has always been forced to do so. And we do not expect miracles to happen in Africa. It is necessary for human progress, for Africa to fully develop, and only the African can do so. Close quote. Chair, what does Sobukwe mean? This is the graduation ceremony in 1949. And he's addressing a class of graduates. Now to understand him, you need to understand him in verbatim, in his own words. And to understand him, you must understand him in context. In terms of who Sobukwe. Sobukwe is the same man who drafted with his colleagues in Forte what became called the 1949 Program of Action that gave life to the ANC at his time. It was not a coincidental. He had a particular ideological frame of mind. He had no fear of making sacrifices. Again, on the 2nd of August 1959, at the Heroes Day commemoration, so we again had this to say, I quote, Now for over 300 years, the whole white foreign ruling minority has used power to inculcate in the African a feeling of inferiority. This group has educated the African to accept the status quo of white supremacy and black inferiority as normal. It is our task to exercise this slave mentality and to impart to the African masses the sense of self-reliance which will make them prefer self-government to the good government preferred by the ANC leadership. African nationalism is the only liberatory creed that can wield these masses who are members of heterogeneous tribes into a solid, disciplined, and united fighting force. 
provide them with loyalty higher than that of a tribe and give them formal expression to their desire to be a nation. It's not me, it's so good in his own words. Yes. Now the question is, do we live up to his expectations? Can a generation and a group and a class of 2019 graduates at UNISA, College of Law, say they can stand before history and say, we belong to the group of Solo. We stand up as graduates at UNISA to articulate and we are an embodiment of Sobu and his ideas and his sacrifices. Because Sobu would have had a good life. He was a graduate, he was a teacher, nobody was forcing him to go into trade unions and fight for the people. He had a cozy job at Vets. Later on, he had a wife and a house in Soweto. But he chose his people. He did not choose all these material things. He chose his people and sacrifice over a good life. What is to be done is the important question. The centers of knowledge production must be Africanized and emptied of their Eurocentric content. Afrocentric city should be at the center of academic scholarly work and led by African people as the people that understand their jurisprudential absence. We need to establish centers of Africanism in our legal system. This is just on the grounds that education is a means of knowledge about ourselves. Therefore, after we have examined ourselves, we radiate ourselves towards and discover peoples and the worlds around us. With Africa at the center of things, not existing as an appendix or a satellite of other countries, things must be seen from an African perspective. Just like capitalism produces its class enemies, being the working class, black academics are produced by the very academics that do not recognize them as academic beings. We must transform the contents of our modules, but not by including a chapter here and there on Ubuntu and Constitutionalism. <laughs> yeah. We must transform the contents of our... We must transform the contents of our module to reflect the reality of the African people, to reflect our lives, to reflect our experience, to reflect our pain. Because when we are absent in knowledge production, when our pain is absent in the movies we watch, in the books we read, in the novels, and in all aspects of society, we forget who we are, and we lose the compass for the journey ahead. Before I close, Chair, I want to take this opportunity to address one important issue of the law and why it's necessary to be Afrocentric and why Sobukwe and his peers were unapologetically Afrocentric. At the moment, we're discussing in our country a legal concept called expropriation without compensation. And I want to debunk it. Firstly, when you expropriate, you acknowledge the legal title of the whole. Mm -hmm. And in Roman law, there's a concept that a thief can never transfer a title because he has never acquired ownership. <laughs> to transfer a title, you must have been an owner. At any given time in our society and in our law, the African people have never said our law has our land has been lost to the foreign dominator or the settler colonizers. 
even when the law was in the hands of the settler colonizers and the dispossessors, the African people said, that remains our land, and we shall fight and perish until our title has been restored. We have never abandoned the right to call our land ours. And why is it important for us to use legal concepts that are correct? It's because when you expropriate, then you say the minority settler dispossessors had legal title. And you must say, no, a thief cannot transfer a title because it's never acquired one. It's in a simple module, uh, Roman Dash Law 101, which is not in indigenous law. It is in UNISA's uh, Dr. Kuhn. Uh, module, Roman what you want. And why is it that we cannot apply it? We are told otherwise. <laughs> Two is to make a metaphor that an example which was made to understand the land issue in the legal process. It's an example which was made to me years ago before I became a member of the case. So you see, when a man comes into your house, Mm -hmm. beats you up, evicts you, and puts you on the garden and converts you to his employees. You are his employee on the first side. <laughs> but you continue to remind him, say, that beautiful house is mine. Yes. <clears throat> when he puts in the new tiles, and puts in new electricity, and all this nice, and you continue to remind him, that house is mine. <clears throat> when you pass away, and he passes away and your kids reminds his kids that that house belongs to our father. Yes. <laughs> There's no title that passes. Because the thief continues to know that this house is not his. He continues to be reminded. The dispossessed continue to hold a view that they have not lost a right. Now, Section 25 of the South African Constitution does something worse. It legalizes land dispossession. Now, that is when the law is legislated by the powerful. You legislate for the rich and you legislate for the minority at total detriment to the dispossessed and the African people. I think Chair gave many things. The second last one as I leave the podium is the Slayman Commission. And I think young people must go and read this recommendation. It does not identify any other organization as the greatest threat to apartheid and settler colonialism. It first identifies Sobukwe and his organization. Because Sobukwe belongs to any organization. Now, you cannot embrace Sobu and his ideas and love them and negate the love for the sheep. Sheep Sobu was too poor. Reject his ideological standing. You put a t shirt of Sobu, you call Sobu, but you do not go to the logical conclusion of that process. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Africa. Good son, Bukawa. Yeah, remember, colleagues, I told you about uh, the power of SNMB by the College of Law in the of South Africa at this present moment. Uh, that power is now being utilized to reshuffle a little bit of the program. Uh, instead of now giving the engagement and interaction, please utilize this opportunity to jot down those questions shut down those comments, because now we should prepare for uh, a counter of performance by rhythmic elements. Oh, I'm, I'm being told that uh, they are not yet uh, ready to set up, but as soon as they are, and then they will definitely let me know. So what I will do now, I will utilize the very same power to move this train. No, they're not yet ready to set up, but as soon as they are, so what we will do, we will take a little bit of a few minutes to have just a brief engagement, just briefly. 
So as soon as they are ready, and then I'll give them the podium to render a cultural performance. So uh, now, uh, panelists and fellow colleagues, I will open uh, the floor for the comments uh, and uh, questions. And then I'll be uh, happy to run around with the mic because we only have one mic. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, I know uh, three hands. I know three hands. You are the fourth one. Master of Ceremonies or Program, <coughs> program Director. Um, thanks to the panelists and their input. My name is Tietzi Kolebatsi and I am a member of the Inter Africanist Congress of the People of Azania. Um, I think the controversy around Sudoku will remain for as long as we don't have a I, I say to Pan Africanists, they can name streets after him, they can name the army base in Hrafrein, uh, <coughs> his hometown, after him. That will not be sufficient. <coughs> it is not so much about the man himself, but what he stood for. Last year in Kimberley, at the Unity Conference, we adopted a thing that says, let us be like Sobukwe unite, consolidate, and defend Sobukwe's legacy. Last week, Saturday, they took a region of the PAC at a meeting in Davidson, and the theme was fighting and restoring the soul of the PAC. Now, like Mafuka Kuisanya said, Sobukwe is the PAC, and the PAC is Sobukwe. I happen to have studied law at Fort Hay. <coughs> I happen to be president of the SRC 30 years after so in 1979. And the one thing with the legalese that frustrated me is that it clearly represents the interest of the ruling class. And students of law think that law is one of those fashionable professions. And they are not conscientized to the fact that the people who rule are not visible. You only see those who govern. Some years back, in the early 90s, a uh, corporate of mine, Bukaraji Kuku, makes a comment. And uh, it was when we could see that inevitably we are going to be having this. And he says, the ANC is going to be a government of convenience. Why? Because state, state belongs to the settlers. And the ANC would only be the, the driver within the government. So it is important for us to understand the difference between state and government. <coughs> All that Sumko was saying when he said you cannot apply an unjust law just he was talking about power. You don't legislate against yourself. You legislate to protect your own aspirations and interests. And that is what is to go the other day, it was on the 5th of April, the day that the Africanist Manifesto was adopted at the inaugural conference in 59. I was asked to address the students of law and threats. And when I made that statement, that yes, you are lawyers, but know that you are defending the current order. They were offended, and afterwards we had a meeting, and they apologized because they understood that yes, they are actually protecting the current order. In a bourgeois society, the bourgeois, the state, is the community that protects the interests of the ruling class. In a socialist state, the state protects the interest of the working class. So the whole history of mankind is about classes in society. So we are Africans, we belong when lastly, 
when I used to go to the school to where my second elder sister stayed as a member of the BCP, ZP Moleta was very close to me in the 70s and 80s until he died. And uh, he had a lot to say about Sobuka, but one of the outstanding things he said about him was his ability. I mean, he was a lawyer before he was a lawyer. If you catch my drift. How could he understand in the 50s that you cannot apply an unjust law? Just and later on became a lawyer himself. He was quite conscious of the fact that law is not neutral. Law always takes the shape of the society of the ruling class. Lastly, for us as the Pan African Congress of Tanzania to liberate the African people, we definitely have to be like so good. Nothing less, nothing more. He's an icon, and that iconic posture of his remains indelibly implanted in our spirit, in our emotions, and in our minds as African people. He is with him. Is it so? Yeah, I think Africa today we have different nations. I think uh, on the very different nations. I think also was in Africa. And uh, I'm a little bit worried about the actual character that we have within the country. To say people have got more information about Robinson's and the Africanist are busy dying and uh, nobody recognizes them. And then when you come back, I grew up in Alex as a young man and I was influenced by the sculptures. And around 1969, I attached myself to the beliefs of the Napoleon Sutras of them. And since then, people said, but you're so small, so young. But you hate whites. And I said, if you said ahead of me to say, whites came as individuals coming from Syria, what made them in their own continent or their own countries? What is the interest of them? And uh, the old man said, Yes, they have the country because there are mineral resources within the continent and they want to utilize them because certain areas not required to the last. But then my quote and referring back to the ancient Africa. Remember that uh, I'm going to go back to the Bible, so the question is as well. When Jacob left his own journey coming to Africa, it was as a result of the house. And he had no alternative to his own So when he arrived, he had all his sons. Remember, they never had boys, by the way. So where did they put the men? And how did they call themselves even today? They are Israelites. Having married foreign people, are they poor enough? That's the question that I asked. And one of the actual persons who even were confined to a church that did not change so much that he even elevated himself to say, we have to draw the Bible what it teaches us. And I said, even in the Bible, there are wrongs that are so weak and they little us as Africans because we all know that Jesus was right. And we have never asked, why is he right? What's the reason for rightness thereof as well? Now, I think uh, I would like to applaud you because I think as a personal member, you have made some real strides in the faculty of law. It's not every way you can do what you have done and unpack it the way you have unpacked it. So I do not have any other thing that I can say except that. Let's expand the Pan Africanism wherever we are. Let's be like so good.
So Bupe was a selfless person and he would talk to anybody at any corner, at any time. So with us, because we have been raised to him, we still lack popular tools to be to. And it's, it's again, it's, it's a worst disaster that man is doing to his own African people. So in closing, I believe as a member of NWC of the PEC, we need more to go to very universities. And I want to see UNISA having inter-university discussions. That is bigger than this room that we are actually going for. Thank you. Is that it? The giants in our midst here. Baba Rolanda is a bundle this morning. But I have a few concerns here that I would like to raise. You know, the teachings of Robert Zogu will represent hope for the African majority. These teachings represent hope for the dispossessed, the oppressed, and the poor. But here's my dynamic, here's my worry, here's my concern. How do we reach out to our people to make sure that this message reaches them and touches their hearts and their minds? That there was a group of people you visited Putin in 1995. And you were housed for the And I was a part of I was, a, I, was, I was a branch second to their Putin each other at that given time when the chairperson was at the JVU. We have covered that area in Guadalupe prior to the, to, the, to the elections of 1994. We did everything that we could. We went to all the colleges there, the universities, the villages and the townships. We battled to reach, to, to reach our people. We battle to win our we battle to win the souls and the hearts and the minds of our people. We're doing the same right here in Victoria. The, then we thought there was this concept of Mandela Mania, and that is why we, we fared as badly as we did. But we later on discovered that the IEC was actually the election the machinery of the African National Congress. And that still has to do not want to love that 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 is well. That cannot be a left hand challenge as well. It is still continuing even today. What is it that we are going to do as the PAC to go out and doing some hard work out there, but to make sure that we protect the gains that we have made in the streets and in the hills and valleys of our country? The other concern is how do we harness the spirit of social to strengthen unity and do away with factionalism and divisions within this S1 movement? Because that sets us back by a hundred years. The last concern, even if it's at the risk of being repetitive, is around the issue of the IEC. Something has got to be done at that level. Can you But we 
are the people withholding our success in regard to issues pertaining to Africanism. Because we are so much interested in identifying ourselves with the colonial institutions called South Africa or Nigeria, instead of seeing ourselves as a black people that are taken from one destiny and are bound to the same continuity. It pains me a lot that whenever issues about the black people are raised, our people pay little attention. The reason is not their fault. The reason is because time and circumstances has put black people into slumber. Our people are sleeping. There is nothing we can do that is going to work for the black people except we first and foremost engage in the process of awakening the mind and consciousness of our people yes. in line with the debates of the philosophies of Honorable Steve Beagle. If we continue to identify ourselves with our so-called nationalities, all matters pertaining the emancipation of the black people is not going to work until we remove our mind and understand that the life and history of a people is the same like the life and history of a baby. Once a baby is born, it must grow. Our life as black people has grown beyond ethnicity and nationalism. Our modern age should be speaking of continentalism. Those people who want to distract us will be so quick to call it racism. And I want you to let you know that in everything they manifest the laws of nature, the law of left and right. Racism, of course, is a legitimate means of emancipating oneself. There is offensive racism on one side and there is defensive racism on the other. I believe we should engage in defensive racism because it is in our right to defend ourselves. But we are not doing enough. Look here. Maybe I'm the only person that is not a South African here. I can guess that. Is that proper? How many Nigerians do you have in South Africa? How many Tanzanians? And how many of them are here? How many of them know that something is being spoken about? So good good? Because you believe Robert Sobuko is a South African. He's not a South African. Yes. He's a black man. <laughs> so, to cut things short, we are engaging. I want you to know that in the cycle of the evolution of humanity, there are legitimacy. The current state of African nations are no longer legitimate because they can no longer defend the interests of their people. So, to make things short, so that we can continue our conference, we are having an organization that is called the People's Movement for African Unity. We've been organizing that, and we are divinely inspired, and we've come to a point where we are preparing to have a conference where we will invite the relevant African ambassadors in South Africa and some political movement like BSC or ANC. This time we don't need discrimination based on ideologies. If there is a difference between Tabor Bloki and the group in Jacob Zuma, they should keep that to their personal ego. We're talking about the black race now. So please, I would, I would consult with the PAC members to see if I can get your legitimate contact details. We will be writing to you. The Africa today does no longer need negotiation. We don't need law. If our forefathers were respecting the laws of apartheid, I could have been here. If our forefathers come and come were respecting the imperialist laws during that time, I could have been here. We don't need to work according to the laws of South Africa. We need our freedom and unity. We cannot continue to be trapped by the laws of white men. Why are we talking about strength of law? 
Africans gave to the world not only the law, Africans gave to the world things such as philosophy, medicine, and, and so forth, my Africa. So, in ancient Kemet, the symbol of the law was represented by a principle called Ma'at. Mm -hmm. And Ma'at was a symbol of a woman. A woman kneeling down with her wings spread out, mm -hmm. carrying a feather. You see in my Africa. And uh, in ancient Kemet, the symbols of the law, you had uh, Ma'at, you, you went before Ma'at to be tested whether you would reach in the afterlife, mm -hmm. whether you were worthy to reach the afterlife, you were put before the scales, the balancing scales mm -hmm. of justice, Absolutely. truth, righteousness, mm -hmm. uh, reciprocity, and so forth, my Africa. So the issue of the law, we have to know that the law as it is constituted currently, it is Eurocentric, and because it is Eurocentric, it is centered around men, naturally. So I think that's one of the things which I wanted to uh, just lay on Kuma Frigobuti. Women are the only people who can change the situation that we are faced with my Africa in relation to the law. Um, another African there spoke about uh, the issue of uh, the borders that are dividing us. Indeed, my Africa, Africa all Robert Mangaluso Sobuko and the PAC, they fought for what they call the United States of Africa. And so it is a tragedy to see today how Africans, even including us, the most progressive Africans, continue to embrace these neo-colonial identities of Nigeria, Zimbabwe, and so forth. And we are so proud of these nationalities and these citizenships that we do not acknowledge that we are Africans before anything else. And then the last thing that I want uh, to respond to is the question of our people. When we go out and speak to our people, the people don't respond to us because we do not speak the language of the people. We are disassociated from the people. We no longer speak a language that resonates with the spirit and the mind of African people. It is well known earlier by someone else who said that we are so puffed up with our academia, our philosophies, our ideologies, such that we speak at past the African people, past the African masses, not to them, not to their hearts and to their souls. This is it. You see, when you are dealing with people who are part of a federation of tribes, <laughs> you, you experience a challenge. <laughs> because before they, they are any other thing, they are a tribe. <laughs> Secondly, when you deal with people who do not understand that, a language is but a means to communicate. Nothing else. But also a language is a carrier of culture. The fact that you, you are born into a family that speaks Sotswana necessarily does not make you a Sotswana. <laughs> because I might have been born in any other family that spoke this is from my parents. And I would have grown there without knowing my parents and met them at 50. What am I? What does not change about me is that I'm an African. The language, yes. the language is just a means to communicate. Them. If you read the history of Bafuke, you would see how the Bafuke were divided simply because. Their king or chief decided to marry a koi wife. Mm -hmm. It divided. Now, when you deal with people in this country, you must be able to understand the type of people you are dealing with. You deal with the type of people that have embraced the colonial setup and the colonial mindset and they make it their own. 
as if they are the originators of this mindset oh, no. and this knowledge. Mm -hmm. And how do we do it? Firstly, we let the understanding of Africa in its dynamics lead. We embrace South Africa and its borders, forgetting that South Africa was only created when the Union was formed. <laughs> there was no South Africa until the Union. The British decided to create, to bring the four republics and form the Union. Yes. <laughs> there were no African countries until the Berlin Conference, <laughs> where African nations gathered without the African people and parcel Africa amongst themselves and decided you will take this part, I'll take this part. Mm. And what then happens in the psyche of the African people? They have embraced that petitioning of Africa as if they are the ones that have petitioned it mm. and reject anything that seeks to say they must unite. Mm. <coughs> I, I, I like making an example. If you go to Mafike and Dinukan, and in Limpopo, in, you get a single village that is in both South Africa and Botswana. Yes. <laughs> My grandparents are in Mafia, but they still own cattle in Botswana. They are uncles away the other side because when my great grandfather went to Kimbali to the mine, he came back the other day and could not go to Botswana back home. Absolutely. He had to settle in Mafia and call it home from then on. <laughs> <laughs> now, when people embrace the borders, and, and, and the tribe, and you laugh and you say, ignorance amongst our people is... Even the most, those who call themselves academics, you know? Even those who call themselves academics, they do not understand the origin, you know, the origin and the base, you know, where they stand. And when the foundation on which you stand is weak, you will not achieve anything. That is why that is why in 1949, it is Yang Sobuka and his peers that come with the 1949 program of action that speaks about self-determination of the African people. Now, today in 2019, <laughs> we must say, how do we make sure that we achieve that? <coughs> but we achieve that uh, dog, because we take the past to guide our movement forward. We learn from the past, but we watch ahead. You do not become like a driver of a car who always looks and focuses on the red view mirror and neglects the road ahead. <laughs> the road ahead of Africa is very important. Institutions of higher learning in these days, and universities in particular, tell us about decoloniality, transformation of institutions of higher learning. Mm. But one interesting thing is that it is led by Afrikaner men mm. mm. and women. And the African people and black academics are absent. <laughs> <laughs> How is it that the very people that have excluded us from academic production now want to tell us what is it that we must include in the academic curriculum that must free us and free our minds? Why is it that you go to the Tarumbek Institute for African and you find uh, Professor Boise? <laughs> 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 And why is it important? Because you must call it out for what it is. <laughs> the law is an instrument of exercise of power. If you don't recognize that, if you wield power, you have a right to determine the content of the law. You will not recognize the fact that you don't need to have a debate every five years around whether the African people must get their land or not. In a parliament which is constituted by 89% black African people. Why? Because they sit there with a mandate which does not assist their own people. They are at the service of the very forces that seek to destroy us. That is the forces that fund the elections every five years. 
as a result, we're going to parliament to legislate on behalf of the mining companies. They're going to parliament to legislate on behalf of monopoly capital. They did not go into parliament to legislate on behalf of their own voters. Why? Because they will seal them after five years. But the monopoly capital, Europe-centric powers understand the power of legislating. As I close, Chair. <laughs> the interesting part about the power of legislation, if you read the history, is the origin of the 1913 Land Act. Mm -hmm. This was crafted by the Chamber of Mines. It was not crafted by Parliament. It was crafted by the Chamber of Mines. And they said to the Union government, you know what? We need labor. And for as long as you allow the African people to farm for themselves or for their own benefit, yes. they will not agree to come and work in the mines. Absolutely. <clears throat> what do you do? Let's dispossess them of the land. Let's make them dependent on labor, on industries. They dispossess the African people of the land through legislation which came from the mining houses. If you follow the origin of affirmative action, an Employment Equity Act, as we celebrate them, it is not the ANC that crafted them. It's the Chamber of Mind that says to Nelson Mandela, no, we know you come with a revolution, but let's take small steps and this will work. And what happened? We embraced the Employment Equity Act and affirmative action and we forgot to legislate on behalf of the total overhaul of the system. And as legal professional, what are we having now? 25 years down the line, we have every forum in court telling you, uh, no, no, 25 years is a long time. Affirmative action must be abolished. You have been sorted. You have you need how it is saying, if you appoint black professors and black academics, you are dropping the standards. <laughs> and you cannot legislate against it. You cannot legislate against saying VETS has predominant law faculty which has white male people. UCT, Stellenbosch, all of them. Why? Because if you dare do that, it's 25 years later. They'll take you to court and you'll suffer the consequences. I really don't know what to say here. Maybe Professor Fadlo. I must single you out without discrimination, but simply to say there is that Gerald Kondo who fell at the battle of the Aperic as a commander in the cause of Sobukwe at the Pan African Congress. And I've never had the opportunity to say Sebaoka because his battle reminds me of Njonga Jeye Nibatu Kumile in Kundarai Kuzibuta Binge Kassami Kuzikurutu Anasema Zendala Zimara Lende Lendi Yasini Kujime Lendi So this is Afrocentricity that we're talking about is not a baby, it is what we are, and we'll never achieve what we want to achieve if we don't know, if we don't want to do it, or we are not proud of ourselves. Uh, for my part, I simply want to confirm that very, very briefly, very, very briefly, if I can, uh, that there would have been no Shabville uprising. No, Frank. When asked Frank Fenon, he will tell you the story. Uh, there would never have been any armed struggle in this country. Uh, no armed struggle was started by Oko. And the expulsion of the South African government from the United Nations was done by the pan Afghanist Congress of Mangalisa Sokwe. Then we have got the International Convention on the Suppression 
Elimination and suppression of the crime of apartheid. A law that was made declaring apartheid illegal. It is surprising, of course, that uh, those who practice apartheid remain out of jails, and those who oppose apartheid uh, were outside. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of things that I would have confirmed here, but uh, I don't think I, I have the time. But I certainly would like to say that, yes, indeed, you can't steal somebody's property and the title is transferred to the thief. It never comes down. Uh, so I will say, well, for my part, I will do my little writing. Here is a man that I found being called a racist. But this is the only man who said there is only one race. The human race. That is so. The man from whom they have a special law also is the only one in the whole world. But I'm saying here is the man who says there is only one race, the human race. We are not dealing with races. Races. I've done a little one here again that I think is important as far as I'm concerned. So where led the road to Robben Island. There would never have been any Robben Island if we did not have a leader who rose in the midst of us in this country. That is why I've always felt that uh, I should do what I can to preserve what is left of that legacy. But let us remember that this is our story. We must tell it ourselves. We must interpret it ourselves. If we don't, they are many with their space and their homes uh, to bury to bury that story. But I can tell you that this story is never going to be to be to be buried. Because the land is ours in the political legacy that Mama Lisa Robert Sobupe gave us. Isn't it? Call on uh, the senior researcher of the Institute for Dispute Resolution in Africa, uh, Dr. Napo, to come and give the summary explanation. after the elders have spoken. <laughs> I don't even know where to start. Eh? Yeah. So, and I feel like uh, I'm, a, I'm a rose among the thorns, if you know what I mean. Eh? The thorns have been talking and now the rose is talking. And I want to tell you that the one who's going to speak after me also is a rose. <laughs> okay. Right. So, that's, in fact, I don't feel like summarizing anything because the song has summarized it for us. We are part of the African continent. The message was great and it's summing it all. So, it is quite an honor for me to be part of this important event whereby we are celebrating uh, the importance of Africa Month. Also, Remembering this, uh, the struggle stalwart 
uh, like uh, Robert Sobukwe. Robert Sobukwe deserves to be celebrated, Ma Africa. He contributed to the liberation of our people. Am I holding it right? Yes. 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 Okay. Is it okay? Perfect. He fought to remove the laws that. Okay. He fought to remove the laws that dehumanized and oppressed our African people. So he deserves to be celebrated on a daily basis. Okay? And it was very refreshing to listen to the deliberations that we've had from uh, some of you. I must say that we have learned quite a lot. And the, uh, the welcome address that was given by the Deputy Dean and the remarks by the 18 head of IDRA where, I mean, they set, to, they, they set the tone. They gave us the significance of why is it that we need to be having days like this. And the panelists meticulously addressed our theme on Sobukwe and the law. They unpacked it so, so well. And to wrap it up, I just want to start by quoting the words by a Pan-Africanist Nigerian writer who said, uh, Chimamanda Adichie, who said, greatness depends on where you are coming from. She argues that our histories cling to us and we are shaped by where we come from. When you see me like this, I'm shaped by Africa. I'm a child of an African soil. Where you are, you are also shaped by Africa. And this quote is resonating with uh, the discussions that we've had since this morning, that uh, we need to be true Africans. We need to be true Africans in every way. We must be proudly, proudly African, as Ndadi Pengo has just said. We need to be the best in Africa for Africa. That's what is coming from the discussion that we've had. And when we are the best in Africa for Africa, it means that we will interrogate the laws that don't promote Africanism. It means that we will encourage the laws that benefit Africans. I'm not talking about uh, ethnicity. The laws that benefit Africans. So we need to be fighting for power. We should not support the laws that are discouraging uh, Africans from being who they are. That is, what is, that is what came up from the discussions that we had. The other issue that came up was that uh, we need to celebrate our African culture. We should not forget who we are. We need to practice our culture accept our values and we should not be ashamed of who we are. We need to do that through many ways. We need to use uh, the poetry, the art, the drama to tell our own stories. Just what Ndate uh, Peko has just said. We cannot have our uh, Europeans coming here to narrate our stories. We know our stories better. We can tell it better. Let us engage with our people and tell our own story right about uh, what we know about Africa. That's what came up from our discussions. And it's important also to embrace our cultural knowledge. Cultural diversity is very important. Uh, we need to be using that cultural knowledge to actually enhance our education system. We need to be teaching our children the history that uh, is not written. So let's write about our culture. Let's, let, let, let's, let's embrace to be Africans. We need to be having many heritage events whereby we are celebrating being African every day. And part of it, part of celebrating our culture is that we need to appreciate our mothers. I cannot overemphasize what uh, Professor Susanti has said. I always <laughs> like him when he says that. We need to be celebrating our women, our mothers, mm -hmm. because they are part of culture. We are here because of them, mm -hmm. right? 
And somebody said we need to establish centers of Africa, Africanism. That is correct. We need to be doing that. And we also spoke about living an impactful life as Africans. How are we holding ourselves? How are we living? We need to live in such a way that uh, Robert Sobuko would be proud of us. We need to practice kindness, selflessness, and everything. Let us be like him. And, uh, and I know that I think it's the dean who said, we must not be hating each other as Africans. You know, we need to be supportive hey, of each other. We need to grow together as Africans. And the issue of the law also came up a lot because it's the theme that uh, Robert Sobukwe uh, was killed by the law. He was killed by the law and us as Africans who are still alive, let's try to fight the law that, that does not support Africanism. Uh, I'm finishing just now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I want to mention that uh, what was very clear also is that we should not be celebrating our Star Wars in May, you know, on the 25th of May as well. It must be part of our life. We must celebrate them every single day. We cannot just wait for the month of May to start talking about them. Let it be our daily uh, language. Our kids must know it. I was asking my son, who's 12? The other day, if he knows who Robert Sobuko is, and he mumbled and mumbled and said, Oh, my way, what are we doing? Hey, let's celebrate our Star Wars every single day. Uh, as the College of Law, the research that we need to be doing, we need to be conducting, actually, it, we should conduct the research that promotes and appreciates Africanism. We are challenged as the College of Law. We need to be documenting key lessons that our future generation can benefit from. We need to be conducting uh, a cutting-edge transformative research that will benefit Africans, for the Africans. Okay? And Dr. Pebble has already started doing that. He wrote a book and we must buy it so that we can know about our history. Police. My Africa. Let's support our fellow Africans, literature is there, let's read and also do our own research, add to it so that our children can learn from it. So let's continue to celebrate who we are as Africans, fighting the laws that do not promote Africanism. I want to end by quoting um, Robert Sobukwe, who said, the will of progress revolves relentlessly and all the nations of the world take their turn at the field class of human destiny. Africa will not retreat. Africa will not compromise. Africa will not relent. Africa will not equivocate. And she will be heard. Remember Africa. Be true Africans in everything that you do. Thank you.